appreciated about the invaders film was the one of the talks that you showed from uh dr king where he was explaining uh meeting with the invaders and how yes they were not promoting violence but weren't afraid to use it but he was also explaining or he was demonstrating that he was willing to meet with the people not the figureheads so so, John, for you, as you realized that back then or even now, what did you learn about Dr. King and, and how he navigated what he was attempting to do? Well, as you say, that's a story that most people don't understand at all. OK. Uh, before 1964, I'll say he was basically the new kid on the block. He had uh, worked with the uh, Montgomery bus boycott that was successful. And so when they had the uh, March on Washington, uh, the older guys were the, the people that John Kennedy brought to Washington to talk about having the uh, March on Washington. And he brought labor unions in, and uh, A. Philip Randolph, Roy Wilkins, James Farmer. Those were the guys that were supposed to be the standout. But nobody counted on Dr. King and his I Have a Dream speech. That turned the tables over on them completely because everybody loved that speech. That was his, I think, introduction to the Nobel Peace Prize. So when you come come away from that, Dr. King has never been like the uh, old line leaders. He was a young guy, you know. He was raised to be a leader. His uh, education was at the best schools. He preached in the best churches. So. He, they were expecting him to be the same as they were. But Dr. King did something different. You know, he understood what it is to, you know, eat off the top of the table. Most Black people, you know, got crumbs from underneath. And his turn away from that kind of life to me, began uh, with them coming out against the wall. That was a major event because everybody was in the Black community was for the war. And Dr. King stepping out and saying no, that changed the dynamics completely. Not, I mean, the civil rights leaders rejected him because of that. And so he had to begin then trying to build a new coalition. Most people don't talk about it from that standpoint of view. And the thing that it enabled him to do that was James Meredith's march against fear. If you remember that, James Meredith was gonna walk from Memphis to Jackson, Mississippi to show that a black man could walk down the highway without fear. He gets shot down by a white guy two miles outside of Memphis. But Dr. King calls uh, you know, all the leaders to come down to, to Mississippi and we're gonna finish the James Meredith March, but they don't come. The only ones that come is SNCC. This is uh, you know, Stokely Carmichael, uh, Willie Ricks, you know, uh, those guys, they show up. And this gives Dr. King an opportunity to actually talk and exchange ideas walking from Memphis to uh, Jackson. And he gets a totally different view of young radicals than what the civil rights leaders had. And the thing that, that really blows the uh, lid off 
was that Dr. King had a face the nation interview. And so he had to drive back to Memphis for the Sunday morning interview. Well, while he's gone, Stokely and Willie Ricks get together and they said, this is the time we're gonna make the statement about black power. And that's the first time that the statement comes forth and in doing so, civil rights leaders, they just go off the deep end about black power, what are you talking about? That's violence and all of this stuff. But Dr. King never took that position. He was like stretched out across the middle, trying to hold the civil rights leaders into the coalition and trying to bring black power advocates into the uh, mix. And is that why you think that uh, Dr. King's uh, death really fractured things even more dramatically because they lost the center per se? Pretty much. Uh, see, he, Dr. King was nothing like the rest of the civil rights leaders. See, and what they had objected to most was well, they felt and said that he was taking the spotlight off of the middle class and putting it on poor people. And even if they could win that fight, the middle class wasn't going to gain anything. And that's a very important point because civil rights was about middle class goals. You know, moving into white neighborhoods, going to white schools, you know, getting jobs. And because of the, the deal that John Kennedy made uh, doing for the uh, March on Washington made them uh, middlemen. Uh, they were the uh, accommodation uh, between white people and black people. And their position was that whatever white people wanted to concede, they would tell them, they would go back to the black community and tell black community, you know, people in the black of what they should accept. So Dr. King had, had really turned that table over because he was not willing to be an accommodationist. He wanted to actually change the system. Absolutely. So Pritchard, as a filmmaker, as a Memphis person, as a white man, et cetera, why is injustice so difficult for people to deal with, overcome, eliminate, reduce uh, these type of things? I'll tell you, I wish I knew. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a direct answer to that, but I feel like everybody kind of in their heart of hearts knows it's important when you walk down the street and you see people that are, you know, just barely getting by. And it, it seems like, especially, you know, I notice it, you know, every time I visit Memphis, I notice it here in New York, it's all over, you know? I mean, things are, I don't want to say worse, but yeah, kind of, we, for the gains that we've made, you know, we, we lose in other places, you know, income inequality right now is worse than it was back then. Um, but yeah, I suppose I don't have a silver bullet, but, uh, but I think it's important to, to talk about and recognize and, and, you know, try and do what anybody can do on their own or in their community. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, John, for you, as you're looking at, the film and what the invaders did, what would you say now is the legacy of both the film, the invaders and what you guys were able to do back with the sanitation strike, et cetera. Change. Change is what it's all about. Nothing stays as it was in the past. And today what we have in America is a, a group of white people who are trying to uh, hold the country or take the country back to a place where the white man's word was law. That was how it was in the 20s and 30s for black people. After Plessy v. Ferguson decision in 
1897, they, the Supreme Court locked the courthouse door to black people. You could not go to court against a white man, no matter what he did. So that's what enabled, uh, you know, whites to dominate black people as they did. And so today we see the Supreme Court trying to reinforce or re resurrect those kind of uh, concepts. And we, as, as a people, are not going to accept that. Just like in the 60s, as you were saying, young people know the difference. They are hungry for leadership, but I tell them, you got to be the leader. You know what's needed. You are living through this. I can't see your future. You have to see your own future and put your, just like we did. We saw a future and we worked at it. We didn't accomplish everything that we wanted to accomplish, but we changed some things. We made it, uh, we made a difference in a way that uh, the country now is trying to go back to that because we did a pretty good job of confronting racism and showing it up for what it is. So young people today, they got the same job. So they why have got to stand up for themselves, not for me. I'm, I'd probably be gone in a few years, but they are just getting started. That's why I harp on 18 year old because their future is before them. And well, why do you think at least it seems like the three of us agree there is a an apathy among the younger generations that wasn't there when you were growing up and you were uh, of the same age now? Why, why do you think that there is that apathy, uh, whether it's political, whether it's economic, whether it's rights? I would say more than anything, it's the commercialism. The commercialism of this society makes having jewelry and things of that nature, big cars, lots of money as the goal in life. And everybody's not going to have that. Most of that is costume. You know, it's they're selling a particular image. They're selling ideas that uh, young people have to commit themselves to uh, buying into that commercialism. And that's the one thing that uh, I, I like about Nas in terms of the way he uses his music, the way he has built an image of himself. He's not one of the bling bling boys. He's not the gangster uh, uh, rapper. He's you know, so it's images like that that need to be projected. But because nobody's buying that, he doesn't get that projection that some of the other uh, rappers and the, uh, you know, I don't, I don't blame hip hop because hip hop is like any other musical. Uh, development for Black people, you know, blues, the big band. It's just another form of entertainment. It's what's being done with that by promoters, you know, by advertisers, by people who own record companies. So young people are, are trapped because you got social media being dominated by uh, people who are, are more in the uh, line of Donald Trump than in the line of Dr. Martin Luther King. You don't get any of Dr. King unless it's like as an icon picture and then they say what he's about, you know. But as I said earlier, 
Dr. King was a different kind of leader. That's for sure. All right. Well, uh, Pritchard and John, I really appreciate your time. Um, anything else we want to add about the invaders or what you're working on now the, to continue the legacy that we should be aware of? Just check it out. I just want everybody, I want, to, I want as many people to see it as, as possible. Well, I'm a, an author. I just, I released my book last year. It's called uh, The 400, From Slavery to Hip Hop. And it's one of the few uh, books that gives a view of what we've gone through as a people from before the transatlantic slave trade, through slavery, and into the uh, 20s and 30s to get to me because my great grandfather was the last slave in our family. And his son, Burley Jr., was the first freeborn lead. And so those stories are important because it tells a story that you don't get in history books. And so if you really want to know the story, get the 400 from slavery to hip hop. you to listen real close to me. I'm going to ask you some real simple questions and I want some real simple answers. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, I, I understand. You said that you couldn't have possibly been at the crime scene at 1115 because you were in the bookstore my, my audio book and my hardcover book at 11.15 when the crime scene occurred in Soren's book. The history of gangster rap. So you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying the books. Right, right. At 11.15, I was, I was at the bookstore at, at 11.15 and when, when I, bought, I bought the books and accidentally left them at the store. So at 11.15, you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying books, right? At, at eleven fifteen, I was. We we was when I was leaving. It was, it was some people coming in, and I I, I forgot to grab. But you, you you don't remember who what they look people, like. What would they look like or nothing? Right? No. Hmm. So. Twelve fifteen. You went to the bookstore buying my audio book and hardcover book and Soren's book at twelve fifteen. So you couldn't have been at the scene because you were buying the books, right? Yeah, at twelve exactly. At twelve at twelve fifteen exactly. I was at the bookstore. <laughs> You know you're not fucked up. Which, which no, one? First you said you were at the bookstore at 11.15 and then you said you was 12.15. You know you're not fucked up. He fucked up. Yeah, he fucked up. He fucked up. Man, you, you confusing me, man. So, you get my book, my audio book, 40 years in Soren's book, History of Gangster Rap, and if you don't, you know you're not fucked up, right? Man, the more those cops ask me questions, the more I wish I bought them motherfucking books. <laughs>